For more than eight years, Syria has been torn apart by civil war, and the human cost has been staggering. It's thought that around half a million Syrians have been killed. About half the population have had to flee their homes. Behind the numbers are the people. Rua and Mustafa are both the same age as the conflict and have known nothing but its disastrous consequences. For four years, I've followed them as they grow up in exile, grappling with what they've been through and the difficult future they now face. This is eastern Aleppo. The rebel-held part of Syria's largest city was subjected to relentless bombing before the regime recaptured it in 2016. Across the country, the war has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Among the dead, not far from Aleppo, were both parents of the boy you're about to meet. Mustafa's in a hurry to get to class. At this makeshift nursery, all the children have lost at least one parent. Mustafa lost both in the barrel bomb that injured him so badly he spent a year in hospital. He was bedridden and traumatized. His remarkable recovery to the boy he is now was an inspiration to his doctors and to other patients. Staff at the MSF hospital in Jordan, which treated him, remember him fondly to this day. I love this boy, like he's my son. And you really miss him, don't you? Yes. Really, I miss Mustafa. <laughs> when you keep just talking about him. What do you miss about him? Everything. His smile. When he was walking in the corridor and just coming to me and hug me and kiss me and ask me to hold him. Mustafa still needs a hip replacement and his left side is partially paralyzed because of a piece of shrapnel lodged in his brain. And it was clear from playing with him that there's psychological damage too. I helped him build a house. When it fell down, he told me it had exploded. But Mustafa's resilience shone through as he started building again, this time for something even bigger. Mustafa came to Jordan along with around a million other Syrian refugees, all left behind homes and lives, bringing with them not much more than painful memories. Mustafa lives in a house full of widows and their children in northern Amman. It's run by a Syrian charity which gives them basic provisions. He was curious about our recording equipment and what this five-year-old said when he borrowed our microphone hit me in the heart. Hundreds of miles away, south of Beirut, we first met Rua, who's also five, at a makeshift school run by Save the Children. Like so many Syrian children, Rua's missed a lot of schooling. She and her family fled Syria after a chemical attack on their neighborhood near Damascus. Hundreds of people died in August 2013 when the rebel-held area of Ghouta was attacked. The UN says the nerve agent Sarin was used. It caused terror. Rua's parents told me they only had a nappy soaked with vinegar to put on her face to protect her. When she closes her eyes and thinks of Syria, what does she see? Thank 
بحبي تهليك سوريا After school, Ra comes back to the camp where she now lives. She says she doesn't like all the mud here and it's hard to stay clean. She's only been gone a few hours, but when your country's been at war for as long as you've been alive, seeing your family safe and sound isn't something you take for granted. In 2016, the Syrian war escalated. Fighting was focused on Aleppo, and it was ferocious. The Syrian regime, helped by Russia, threw everything at the battle. By the time we next met Ruwa and Mustafa, Aleppo was firmly back under government control. <laughs> Mustafa is now six, and I went back to Amman to see how he was getting on. In the makeshift preschool he goes to with other Syrian orphans and his little sister Dua, he's eager to learn. And on this trip, he opened up to me about the airstrike that took away his parents. Three times a week, faithfully, his grandmother takes Mustafa to physiotherapy. The second time I met Rua, the playground was new, but daily life is tough in the camp where she now lives. Rua has been in this makeshift camp now for almost half her life. Imagine never being able to shower. Rua shows me the shared toilets. It's fine by day, but at night, she says, she's terrified. <laughs> This tiny school wasn't here when we met her last, but the education she gets is basic at best. No wonder her father tells me that he lies awake at night, worrying about her future. Not long after we met Rua, there was another chemical attack. The town of Khan Sheikhoun subjected to this terrifying tactic. And this time there was a response. Though the regime denied involvement, the United States fired missiles at a Syrian airbase. A limited intervention, which left many Syrians still feeling abandoned by the world. Mustafa is seven now and at a government-run school in Amman. I'm always struck when I see him by his good humour, the way he keeps going, keeps picking himself up, sometimes quite literally. But what struck me most about him on this visit is that as time passes, his sense of his parents is slipping away. Back at home, his grandmother brings out a photo of his father Ibrahim. <laughs> <laughs> Mustafa is now doing physio once a week. Beside him is Banin. She lost her father, two brothers and a sister when a shell landed on her home. Syrian children have paid a catastrophic price for the war. And yet, in art therapy, Mustafa draws himself smiling. Despite everything he's been through, everything he's up against, I've never heard him complain.
Hua is also seven now, and what I noticed most is how she's beginning to forget Syria. She can only really remember life as a refugee. And even after nearly five years here, she still hasn't got used to the camp's shared toilets. But here she is at least safe. Her cousin Mohammed was killed in an airstrike in eastern Ghouta this week. Her father's thigh bone was shattered by a sniper's bullet and he can't work. Her oldest sister was hit by shrapnel. Back in Syria, meanwhile, the war grinds on, claiming ever more lives. Dera is a strategically important city near the border with Jordan, and it's where the uprising against Bashar al-Assad first began. But the Syrian regime claims victory here too, and even more families are displaced. In early 2019, I came back to meet Rua. She's eight now, and I'm struck by how the dream that she and her family had of going home has crumbled. She's even more frustrated, too, by the conditions she's living in. This is home, one room to eat, sleep and study in. But Rua is often sick here. Her father tells me that it's crushing for him to see her suffer and not be able to help. Mustafa is also now eight. He's becoming more aware of his disability and of what he's missing that other kids have. He too is adamant now that his future is not in the Middle East. Mustafa needs help to dress and wash. The challenges that Mustafa's facing are no less daunting than when we first met him when he was five, but he's no less determined. كتير حنون كتير عاطفي بحب اللعب مقبل على الحياة يجري يعني بالرغم من عنده مشكلة مثلاً صحية لكن بحب يلعب. The Syrian war has created many Mustafas, children whose injuries and loss will stay with them for the rest of their lives. يا حبيبي. كان هنا قاعد بالشارع يقولون دحج الزلمة. Mustafa is saying his evening prayers. It's only recently that Mustafa stopped screaming in his sleep, but his grandmother still can't rest. She lies awake, she says, 
terrified of what will happen to him when she's gone.